How about number three, the one-man pastor system? Now, I'm going to say something right here in front of the whole world. I was wrong in my former stand. I used to stand for the one-man pastor system. So I'm apologizing. I apologize to you, Lord, and I apologize to you people out there. And I had a couple of brethren that have been very, very faithful, very uh, understanding, very kind to me, and they have lovingly corrected me on this issue a couple of times, and I didn't listen at first, but I looked into it, I researched it, and I went, well, that's what the Bible says. Uh, the one-man pastor system is not scriptural. Okay, The King James Bible teaches a plurality of elders in a local congregation, a local fellowship. And we're going to look at the scriptures to prove this. All right. So where did this one-man pastor system come from? Well, there's a church out there that has a pope. Hmm. Catholic Catechism number 890. The mission of the magisterium is linked to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Christ. It is the, this magisterium's task to preserve God's people from deviations and defections and to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error. Thus, the pastoral duty of the magisterium is aimed at seeing to it that the people of God abides in the truth, truth that liberates. To fulfill this service, Christ endowed the ch church's shepherds with the charism of infallibility in matters of faith and morals. The exercise of this charism takes several forms. You say, now, oh, come on, Brian, you are just so ridiculous. Come on, man. There's no independent fundamental Baptists out there that claim infallibility. Oh, brother. Right? Well, here we have a YouTube video, a link to a YouTube video. I actually used this thing in my study on carnival preachers. If you haven't seen that, you know, go, go listen to that audio sermon. And I'm going to show you the actual video in this study. Okay, now the link is there to the whole sermon, and you can watch the whole sermon if you can endure it, because <laughs> um, the guy just screams and is, puts on a little show the whole way through it. It's just ridiculous. But if you want to start watching around the video around 1346, 13 minutes, 46 seconds, to about 1652, you'll see this pastor flat out lying and saying that you can't question a man of God. And I debunked that whole thing of the man of God being that title being used for a pastor today, uh, that is totally, totally unscriptural, just totally wrong. It's a total lie. Already, I've I've covered all those scriptures in the Carnival Preacher sermon, so I'm not going to get into it here. But rest assured, that thing is not true. Um, it's ridiculous. But uh, we're going to watch here a clip of what he says from this time here, and you're going to see him say, you know that I don't care how wrong the man of God is, you keep your hands off of him. So here it is. Don't talk about the man of God no more. Just go again. Get your hands off of him. It is a 100% guarantee. You lay your hand on the man of God, you got judgment coming to your house. It's a 100% guarantee. You lay your hand on the man of God. You got judgment coming down to your house tonight. Well, he's wrong. I don't care how wrong he is. You better keep your hands off the man of God. You better leave his wife alone as well. I said you better leave his wife alone. Don't put your hands on his wife. You better leave these young ones alone too. You better leave his wife and his young ones alone. You better not put your hands on the man of God. 
you, you better leave him alone. Yeah. Better leave his wife alone. You better leave his children alone. Don't put your hands on the man of God's church. You better get your hands off the man of God's church. Somebody said that ain't the man of God. That lets me know how much you've read your Bible. You've done heard some some preacher say, "Yes, this is God's church. Yes, we are His people." But the man of God is the under shepherd of the shepherd, and he's got to keep her, and he's laying at the door. You better take your hands off of the church tonight. Hundred percent guarantee, judgment's coming down to your house. Promise you. 100% guarantee. Judgment is coming to your house. Is that all right? That all right? That all right? That's all right, ain't it? Deacon Bird. Isn't that something? And those are independent fundamental Baptists. Well, my indef independent fundamental Baptist pastor doesn't act like that. Well, good for him. But these guys do. And I've seen that thing among the IFB churches out there. They will talk about the pastor being the man of God. And there are people that will submit themselves to whatever that man says. He rules that congregation like a pope. A little Protestant pope. And you don't dare question him. Baltimore Catechism number 148. Did Christ intend that the special power of chief teacher and ruler of the entire church should be exercised by St. Peter alone? Christ did not intend that the special power of chief teacher and ruler of the entire church should be exercised by St. Peter alone, but intended that this power should be passed down to his successor, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, who is the vicar of Christ on earth and the visible head of the church. Now, I'm real sorry, but again, if you go into the average independent fundamental Baptist church and you say, who is the visible head here? They're not going to say, what? The visible head? Uh, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, friend. We don't have a visible head. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, oh, you mean the pastor, the senior pastor? That's what they're going to say. And a lot of these guys get on such an ego power trip. Not all of them. I'm not condemning them all. But I'm saying there are those out there that do get on such an ego, maniacal trip that they literally do believe that they are infallible and that you can't question them. They literally believe that. And a lot of these guys, they'll go along fine and they'll, they'll ride their high horse, you know, and just, oh, you can't tell me what to do. And, oh, you know, I'm the man of God and whatever. And a lot of those guys end up so messed up in sin They'll have an adulterous relationship or fornication or something like that or, or some other kind of thing. They'll steal money from the treasury or whatever. I've seen that thing happen a lot. You know, why? Well, because the guy got too big. You know, and the Lord says, okay, buddy, you want to take glory away from me? I'm going to bust you down a few rungs. Third John chapter 1. Verses 9 through 11. This is what I was referring to earlier. It says here, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Probably because they weren't independent fundamental Baptists, you know. Weren't part of his church. Sure. Verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren. Same thing we read earlier. You know, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good uh, is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Huh. Now the next link here I have in the PDF, if you haven't seen this thing yet, this is a, another 
egomaniac, independent fundamental Baptist pastor. This guy's not a pastor. He's a hireling. But uh, this guy here is Pastor Jim Stanridge of Emmanuel Baptist Church located in Skiatook, Oklahoma. All right. And we're going to watch this little clip here. It's a couple minutes long, but it's important that you watch this thing. Watch this guy go off on a power trip. Total power trip. Why? Because he believes he's the man of God. He believes he is Pope of this congregation. Check this out. But the fellow just got killed won't do it again, will he? And this is a God institution. And he'd be surprised. Son, don't go to sleep while I'm talking. Hey, hey, hey. Don't, don't, don't you lay your head back. I, I'm, I'm important. I'm somebody. Now, you might do your English teacher that way, but I'm not teaching English. I'm teaching eternal life here. I love you. You know I love you. Have I convinced you I love you? Uh, yeah. You better, th you better nod your head yes. All right. Come on. Put it right there. All right. You stay awake and you listen to me. You say, well, he may never come back. Well, he ain't here now. And where have you been, Mr. Underwood? And I noticed on the calendar I'm supposed to marry y'all. What makes you think I'd marry you? You're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents. And you want me to marry you to her? And you want to marry him? And he don't even know where he belongs? And you don't even know where you belong? Now, let me tell y'all everybody here how much I love these kids. Do you know I love you, sir? Stand up, big boy. Do you know I love you? All right. All right, give me a little love. I'm a real deal. Yeah. All right. I know you are too, but you ain't been here. You can't get this in any other church in town. Now, y'all don't want me. All you got to do is tell me we won't have a church fight because I'll get in my little Connie and we'll get in her little Buick Enclave. It's paid for. And. We'll sell what we need to sell, and we'll go on down the road, and we'll find some little podunk church that don't know up from down, and I'll find me a dozen Joe's baskets who don't have a pot or a window and who will shout Jesus, and I'll give the rest of my life to them. But I'm not interested in recreating the prostitute of the church. Amen. You remember when I came here, Kelly? You remember where your wife was, where your sisters were. Do you remember where they were? And we made holy war. Do you remember that? Stay with me. Don't quit me. Oh, Brandy. Oh, Brandy's a sweet girl and she's got her children. Yes, y'all are good and y'all are fine, but your children will turn on you if you don't hold up the standard in the banner of God. And if they don't turn on you, they'll just, you'll just produce nice little whirlians. Are y'all keeping the camera on me back there in the little video room? Good. We're having trouble in the video room. There's no one finer than young Cox back there. And he comes down here and spends hours in that thing. But he has a little attitude adjustment that we're going to fix. For the Cox, you listening? Because, Brother Cox, I can fix your adju attitude adjustment. Now, I don't care what your mama thinks and your daddy thinks. And I don't have a better friend than your mama. But, Mama, you get out of my way when I'm messing with that boy because I'm his preacher. I'm, I'm yours when I'm talking to you. But I'm his when I'm talking to him. And last I checked, he's a grown man. And that video room ain't going to be a youth hangout. We might as well just fix this thing. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, if you don't know what you're doing wrong, son, you don't care about what I want to do right. Because if you loved me and you submitted to me, you'd know what my heart is and my message is and you wouldn't go about establishing your own kingdom in the video room. I really 
feel good now. Jesus. Jesus. Hey, are you falling asleep on me? You better not because I'm an important person. You know, woo, woo, cuckoo, cuckoo. You know, <laughs> what a nut. You know, incredible. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 19 and 20 says, For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer. In other words, suffer is like you put up with here in, the, in context. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. That's exactly what that Jim Standridge false prophet was doing. Okay? And that's what a lot of these IFB pastors do. That's what a lot of them do. What do they do? They bring you into bondage. You better be here every time the doors are open. If you don't, it's idolatry. They devour you. What do they do? Well, like that guy did there, he was devouring the people, making a fool out of them. If a man take of you, you are giving your 10% tithe, aren't you? You know? How about if a man exalt himself? We just saw it there. I'm an important person. I'm the man of God. You know? Mm -hmm. That's what they do. If a man smite you on the face. And the funny thing is, I actually know the one... Baptist, IFB Baptist church building I used to go to, Liberty Baptist, one of the pastors there, Dr. Bob Hamlin, they told me, I wasn't there when he was there, you know, it, the thing fell apart because he had problems or whatever, but uh, they told me, some of the people that used to go there back in its glory days, you know, Jack Hiles would come there, Jerry Falwell would come there, but they told me back in the glory days that this Bob Hamlin would literally go up to people he had a problem with and grab them and shake them and yell at them in front of everybody. Make a fool out of him. Why? He was an egomaniac. And the one time I was actually going to Liberty Baptist, he came back for a visit, came back to preach, and he actually came in and he said, quote, this is an exact quote, I'll never forget this, he was standing up there at the pulpit and he said, we are not all on the same intellectual level. And by the way, some of you people, you know, I, I got a brother and he was like, Brian, I'm sorry to hear that these bad things have happened to you, you know, among the independent fundamental Baptist churches that you've attended, but, you know, you can't brush stroke all the Baptist churches because of your bad experiences. Uh, it's not just my bad experiences. I've gotten emails from quite a few people, probably into the hundreds, of these IFB pastors that are just on total power trips, saying, you cannot join my church because you weren't baptized in my church or by a church that I recognize. I actually had a brother say, tell me about that story. And he was like, but I was baptized in a Baptist church by full immersion. And he said, yeah, but it's not a Baptist church that I recognize. <laughs> what is this? Well, there's a lot of diatrophies out there. A lot of hirelings that are on a power trip because they believe themselves to be the man of God. They are a pope in their own mind. But I'm sure that was derived from the Bible, right? Because after all, independent fundamental Baptists are Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice, right? No, they actually follow the catechism many, many times. But let's continue. You say, now Brian, you know, you're just getting ridiculous here. I mean, Baptist pastors are not like this. You know, they don't, they don't exalt themselves. They don't magnify themselves, you know. Um... If a man exalt himself, you know. How about this video of Jack Hiles? Check this out. Isn't that something? I mean, can you imagine 
having people do that for you and you go along with it? Jumping up and down and screaming. Ah. Let's see what the real men of God did in the Bible. Acts chapter 10, verse 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Hmm. Now according to Catholicism, Peter was the first pope. But as the first pope, he wouldn't let anybody bow down to him. I guess he wasn't a very good pope, was he? You know, wasn't a very good independent fundamental Baptist either, I imagine. Acts chapter 14, verses 11 through 18 says, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, Lycon, Lyconia, uh, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the, their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We are also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these things scarce restrained they the people that they did had not done sacrifice unto them. You see, real Christians are afraid of men worshiping them. It should bring, it should inspire fear if somebody comes up to you and falls down and begins to worship you. You should be like, whoa, what are you doing, man? Get up. Don't you dare bow down in front of me. You know, Jack Hiles should have walked out from that side door and those people, whoa, start screaming. He should have just looked at them and said, stop this. Stop this idolatry. How dare you emulate me? You need to repent of that. But he didn't. Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. John fell at the feet of an angel. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. Do it unto Baptists instead. No, I'm sorry. It doesn't say that. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So even a supernatural being like a angel there, which by the way, I believe that angel was actually a Christian, but you know, even a being like an angel says, don't worship me. Don't bow down in front of me. But you have these IFB pastors that many times allow people to worship them. And there again, I've heard stories. People, another one told me that uh, there was a Baptist pastor down south and he would tell people who to marry. You know, some guy come over and he'd say, I'd like to marry so No, she's wrong for you. I want you to marry so-and-so. And these people were standing up and the, and the one guy stood up and he said, if there was a fourth member of the Trinity, it'd be our pastor. Okay, that's not my experience. That's an experience of somebody that I talked to. And I've talked to lots and lots and lots of Baptists out there, people that have gotten fed up with the nonsense in their independent fundamental Baptist church and they left. So does the King James Bible teach a one-man pastor or multiple elders? Let's see about this. Acts chapter 14 verse 23 says, And when they had ordained them elders, that's plural, in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Okay? They, them, elders. It's all plural. Not one. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, plural, in every city, as I had appointed thee. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who, all, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, uh, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords, plural again, lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. All right, let's continue here, and I'm going to get into why the one-man pastor system is so bad. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 6 says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders... And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that, is what, that it was needful to circumcise them, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Okay. Now you have Peter stands up and speaks, and then Paul, Barnabas and Paul, and then James. They stand up and speak in the verses 7 down through 21. So, but we're going to pick up here at verse 22. Acts chapter 15, verse 22 says, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church. Notice it's speaking of a singular group there, that church that was meeting there, you know, in Jerusalem. Uh, but it was multiple elders. To send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 21 says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Hmm. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Thou therefore, my oh, and then here we go to Second Timothy chapter two, verses one and two. And I'm going to show you a reason why it's good to have multiple elders and not just one man of God. It says here, Second Timothy chapter two, verses one and two. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. All right. You got to be careful about one man being your pastor. Because you see, if he's messed up, you got a problem. But if you have multiple elders, they can kind of correct one another. They can kind of keep each other in check. See? And take the, the situation that I just left. And this situation is, again, there's probably other ones like this. This man that was the pastor of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church building I was going to, he was the only pastor there. And he owned the property and the building. How are you going to get rid of somebody like that when he gets corrupt? What are you going to do? How's he going to be overruled? See? And, you know, you'll see this thing. A lot of these IFB pastors... You know, you don't like what I'm preaching? Then get out of here. Hit the doors, brother. Which is good advice, you know, and don't go back. But uh, the point is, see, they're living in a system where they cannot be corrected. You can't stop them. You can't question them. See, that's very dangerous. But if you had multiple elders, well, then they keep each other in line. One of them can't get too big-headed, can't get too puffed up. And there are other scriptures as well that talk about this thing of the plurality of elders. And I'm giving a link to an article there. And I can't endorse everything on the website, the whole website. I, I just went over some of it. I read some of it. It looked like a good article. Um, you know, as with anything, eat the meat, spit out the bones, read the article, uh, whatever you can get out of it, you know, fine. If, it, if you see it's not lining up with scripture, then just forget that part. But uh, there's an article about the thing of plurality of elders. Because I don't want to keep going on and on and on about that. But that's something that I, 
I'm probably going to have to redo my house church video because I did talk about the position of pastor. And of course you have 1 Timothy chapter 3 there it talks about if a man desire the office of a bishop. And you say, well then see that's just one man. Uh, well, would it make sense to say every man that desires the office of the multiple office of the bishops? No. It's just saying if you're going to be a bishop or, or an elder, in other words, um, and by the way, the word pastor doesn't appear in the King James, only pastors. Um, but if you're going to be an elder, one of these men that rules over a local assembly, then, you know, you should meet the qualifications there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But, I mean, it's given as you should meet these, but if you're there and you don't meet those qualifications, well, you know, okay. I mean, there's, I'm just saying... You can't get too picky about that. I mean, you got to remember, it says about, you know, he's to be the husband of one wife. And you say, well, then Paul was disqualified because he wasn't the husband of one wife. See, you get into some real wacky stuff. And I had a guy actually write to me and say that I don't qualify to be a pastor because uh, I don't have at least two children. <laughs> yeah, okay. Whatever. Okay, number four, the fourth thing here. How about divine liturgy? The repetitious service. You come every week and you come in and you sit down and the pastor gets up. They play the instrumental music and then the pastor gets up and welcomes everybody and does the announcements. And then you have a hymn and then you have, you know, offering taken or whatever. And then you have somebody do special music and then you have uh, the message and then you have a hymn at the end of the thing. And, you know, and it's just like every week you do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, where do you see this being done in the Bible? Where do you see that thing being done in the New Testament? It's not there. Where did it come from? Let's read. Catholic Catechism number 1143. For the purpose of assisting the work of the common priesthood of the faithful, other particular ministries also exist, not consecrated by the sacrament of holy orders. Their functions are determined by the bishops in accord with liturgical traditions and pastoral needs. Servers, readers, commentators, and members of the choir also exercise a genuine liturgical function. You say, no, come on, Brian. All right, all right, you're going too far now, Brian, because you're cutting on choirs. And readers? A guy standing up and reading out of the Bible is this great satanic thing? No, I think that reading out of the Bible is a wonderful thing. But again, to say that this is a practice of the New Testament, it's not in there. Okay, it's not there. Is it in the Catholic Church? Yes. Mm-hmm. The Catholics have done that thing for centuries. They have the guy that stands up and reads the Bible, the sacred scripture portion for the day. Just like a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches. And the choir too, by the way. So we'll be getting into that as we continue here. Catholic Catechism number 1154. The liturgy of the word is an integral part of sacramental celebrations to nourish the faith of believers. The signs which accompany the word of God should be emphasized. The book of the word, a lectionary or a book of the gospels, its veneration, procession, incense, candles, the place of its proclamation, lectern or ambo, is audible. its audible and intelligible reading, the minister's homily, which extends its proclamation, and the responses of the assembly, acclamations, meditations, psalms, litanies, and professions of faith. Now, all that mumbo-jumbo is a lot of Catholic stuff, but the point is there, notice a couple things that you'll see with the average independent fundamental Baptist church, and you won't see it in the New Testament. Number one, you have the reading of some of the Gospels or reading of a book of the Bible. They'll have a guy come up front and he'll read a portion of Scripture before the sermon. And then you have the homily, which is very interesting because a lot of the Bible seminaries actually teach homiletics. Homiletics is a Greek thing where you basically have people learning to give homilies, speeches, you know, oration. They're told how to enunciate words and how to, how to say things with effect and all this stuff. Again, where's this stuff at in Scripture? Okay, the pagans were doing that. They're the Athenians in Acts chapter 17. They were the ones that were coming together and hearing these great speeches and orations. And they thought Paul was going to come in and do a thing like that, you know. And, and Paul just preached to them. And they were just like, yeah, you're, you're kind of half crazy. Others were like, yeah, we'll hear you again, you know, this matter. But uh, you can read Acts chapter 17. 
But then you see the responses of the assembly. Amen? I mean, you know, when a pastor does a sermon, you know, and he makes some good points, amen? You should say amen. Amen? You know, let me hear an amen. You're going to amen me? I'm going to, you better amen me. Because if you don't amen me, I'm just going to amen myself. Amen? Amen? Amen, amen? See? I mean, where's this stuff coming from? Okay. Catholic Catechism number 1140. It is the whole community, the body of Christ, united with its head, that celebrates liturgical services are not private functions. See? You can't worship at home. You're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Uh-huh. But our celebrations of the church, which is the sac sacrament of unity, namely the holy people united and organized under the authority of the bishops, therefore liturgical services pertain to the whole body of the church. They manifest it and have effects upon it, but they touch individual members of the church in different ways depending on their orders, their role in the, the liturgical services, and their actual participation in them. For this reason, rites which are meant to be celebrated in communion, uh, or I'm sorry, in common, with the faithful present and actively participating present, and actively participating, should as far as possible be celebrated in that way rather than by an individual and quasi-privately. Do you realize what I just read to you there? I just read to you that in the Catholic Catechism, it's saying you're supposed to worship with all the church, all the people gathered together. You can't do it privately. And that's exactly what a lot of the independent fundamental Baptists believe and preach. <clears throat> but let's look at the actual thing of the Mass here. Okay, this is dummies.com. You know, the Catholic worship service is the Mass. You know, again, I have the link there. The Catholic, the Catholic worship service, the Mass. It says here, the Mass, the formal official worship service of Catholicism, is the most important and sacred act of worship in the Catholic Church. Going to Mass is the only way a Catholic can fulfill the third commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day and the only regular opportunity to receive the Holy Eucharist. The Mass incorporates the Bible, like we were talking about, prayer, sacrifice, hymns, symbols, gestures, sacred food for the soul, and directions on how to live a Catholic life, or Baptist life, depending on where you go all in one ceremony. The first part of the Mass is in the Western Latin Church is the Liturgy of the Word, and, is, and its main focus is on Bible readings as an integral part of daily and weekly worship. The second part is the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and its main focus is the holiest and most sacred part of the, the Mass, uh, Holy Eucharist. Eastern Rite Catholics call their Mass the Divine Liturgy, but it's essentially the same. Eastern Catholics also use the twofold division of Liturgy of the Catech, Humans and Liturgy of the Faithful, which coincide with the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. The differences are merely from the fact that in the West, the Mass follows the tradition of the Roman Liturgy, but in the East, it's the liturgical tradition of Constantinople. Another way you can say this is, you know, uh, that's what I think of Catholicism. Continuing here, the Liturgy of the Word. The first part of the Mass is built around hearing the Word of God. After the priest and his attendants process to the altar, the priest and con congregation participate in the penitential, penitential rite, which is simply an acknowledgement that everyone is a sinner and has sinned to some degree during the week. This confetture is followed by the Kyrie, which expresses public guilt and shame for any sins against God. The Gloria, a prayer or hymn of adoration of God, is followed by a prayer. Again, a lot of this stuff is incorporated right into independent fundamental Baptist worship service, services that addresses all three persons of the Holy Trinity. And that usually sets the tone for the rest of the prayers and Bible readings at Mass. Every day has its own unique prayers and readings chosen by the church, not the individual parish. A qualified lector then reads the designated passages of the day. Following these readings, the congregation, which has been sitting, stands while the priest or deacon reads the Holy Gospel, which contains the very words and deeds of Christ and require the respect shown by standing. You ever been in an independent fundamental Baptist church and they say, I'd like to rise here for the standing of the Word of God, you know, need to respect the Word of God by everybody standing? Um, chapter and verse. For New Testament Christian. I can show you chapter and verse in the Catechism. 
Continuing here, on Sundays and Holy Days, the homily is followed by the profession of faith or creed, which succinctly sums up all the teachings of the church. Then comes the prayers of the faithful, which are petitions uh, for the Pope, the church, the civil authorities, current concerns, and so on, to which the people respond with, Lord, hear our prayer, or hear us, O Lord. The Liturgy of the Eucharist. As the Liturgy of the Eucharist begins, everyone sits down and baskets are passed to collect monetary offerings. Uh, do you pass a collection plate in your independent fundamental Baptist church? Um, where was that at in the Bible again? Well, that's right, it's not there. Why? It's a tradition. Your practices are not based solely on the King James Bible. They're based on Catholicism. Okay, now it goes down through there. I'm not going to read all this. You can get the PDF and read all this stuff here. But it goes down through the Mass thing, the thing of the Mass. Now, I haven't been to an independent fundamental Baptist church yet where they're actually teaching that when they have Holy Communion there, they aren't teaching that it's the literal, physical body and blood of Jesus. Now, okay, it's done in commemoration and remembrance of Jesus' death on the cross. Okay, I haven't been to one yet. There could be one out there. Lord only knows. Okay, it says here, After receiving Holy Communion, the faithful go back to their pews and pray silently for a few minutes before sitting down. Again, I have seen that thing at the, uh, you know, been in some independent fundamental Baptist churches, and they say, you know, while the elements are being passed out or whatever, pray silently. Where did that practice come from? The Catholics are doing it. You say, then you're saying it's bad to pray silently? No, I didn't say that. I just simply said, where are you getting these traditions from? When they're not in the Bible, but the Catholics are doing it. You're getting them from the Catholics. The Mass ends with, this, with the priest blessing the congregation and sending them forth to spread the word of God and put it into practice. Hmm. Make a lot of IFB church buildings I've gone to. <laughs> 